Hello for everybody on my behalf as well. It's great being here. And uh, the theme of the afternoon is personalized medicine, uh, which is a big, big change in healthcare. Uh, it's a long-term trend. And one of the revolutions that needs to take place in order for the personalized medicine trend to come through is a revolution in genetic testing. And I'll try to open up that, the state of genetic testing, uh, the hurdles in it, uh, where we are at the, at today in the next, say, 10, 15 minutes. And thinking about personalized medicine, uh, briefly, it's about getting the right clinical follow-up, the right treatment to the right individual or patient. And DNA is sort of the, the ultimate uh, marker for individuals. And um, a lot of the treatments uh, relate to genetic profile. A lot of the clinical follow-ups require understanding of the genetic profile. So that's, I think, it, why it's very important to understand that genetic testing is one of the biggest drivers in personalized medicine. And genetic testing has taken quite a big, big leap during the past 20 years, and moreover, during the past 10 years. Uh, it's a classic chart. It's the dropping sequencing cost. So the past eight years or so, when the so-called NGS technology, technology was introduced, uh, the cost of sequencing human DNA has just fallen dramatically. And uh, Angela and Jolie did a good, good work in creating awareness for clinical testing for breast cancer. And what we've seen in the recent, say, two or three years is the emer real emergence of clinical applications of genetic testing. And digging deeper into that, um, when we talk about genetic testing or DNA sequencing, uh, it's very important to divide it for research use, uh, clinical use, and then there's also consumer testing, which is very different in, um, as a field. But research and clinical are very closely related. Uh, for the past 10 years, we've seen an abundant amount of research projects where DNA is sequenced. We have the 1,000 genome projects, 100,000 100, genome projects, and all of that research where the scientific community has identified abundant, abundant amount of information from our DNA. That is now turning into clinical applications. And this is very recent as a development. It's been only the past, say, two or three years when, uh, when the real clinical DNA diagnostics applications have emerged. And that's because we've been now for about 10 years very aggressively sequencing everything between heaven and earth in you know, the human DNA. And uh, thinking about what we're able to do with the information uh, when we go into the clinic. Um, there's about 7,000 uh, inherited disorders, of which about half, 3,500, have a so-called uh, known molecular genetic background. And this means that we can sequence them and understand, understand the connections. And uh, even though these disorders are relatively rare, uh, when we bundle up uh, the inherited disorder uh, space, it's actually quite big. It affects more than 50 million people in the US and Europe alone. And uh, this is, it's just recently when we have you know, gained access for the tools that enable uh, genetic testing really come into the clinic. And as an example, there's a patient of Blueprint um, from 2014. It was a uh, sorry, nine-year-old girl uh, who had a very severe heart disorder. And they've been trying to come up with a diagnosis for seven years tried six different approaches, but the technology was not there yet. Uh, back in 2014, uh, we, we sequenced the data, uh, did the interpretation, and got the right result in 21 days. So it's just to indicate that this is, this is just emerging into the clinic. And uh, the genetic testing field itself is, is growing a lot. Uh, personalized medicine as a trend is, is a big one, so that there's a lot of discussion of having, having a uh, patients' uh, genome sequenced when they enter the clinic, enter the, you know, go to see a physician. But we're still in the, in the phase where we're treating um, people who already have an indication, people who already come for a clinic for a reason. And uh, looking, at the, looking at the growth, uh, we entered the market two years ago. Uh, we've so far analyzed in the clinical setting more than 3,000 patients. Uh, we have about 130 customers in 17 countries. And this is just sort of starting. The whole field is just starting to emerge. And we've been only focusing on cardiovascular disorders so far. And if we think of what, what ge clinical genetic testing process uh, consists of, basically it's a simple process. 
um, or, or a model. Uh, first, we take the patient sample, which is sent to a centralized lab. Um, and we sequence the DNA. Uh, we have proprietary technology from Stanford for that. Uh, then we crunch the data with IBM Watson. Uh, and end of the day, we provide a clinical report to the physician. So that is the product that we provide. And uh, then look, looking at this from a personalized medicine point of view or the whole trend, uh, if we think that what will it take for genetic testing to become mainstream so that, so that this, this becomes more popular? So basically, uh, there's two things. The product, the panel, it really needs to be almost perfect in terms of how accurate it is, how well we are able to understand or analyze the DNA and catch all the variation in the DNA. And also needs to be very cheap. So this is, this is the emergence of personalized uh, medicine, genetic testing into the clinic has a lot to do with the cost of the test. And when we entered the market, uh, we cut away about 25 to 75% away from the market prices of clinical tests. So that is a big change in the setting. Um, another big thing is that instead of having, a, say, 95, 97% uh, accuracy, it's, it's crucial to have 100% of the target regions covered with, with a good enough sequencing quality. So that's, that's, that's very key. So that loses out the false negatives. Another part is that all of the medically relevant uh, actionable genes need to be covered in the tests. So the, earlier on with the previous technologies, the panels were really narrow. The physicians needed to make choices between different panels. They didn't necessarily understand which one to pick. But nowadays, the panels are getting larger, and large pan panels make the use much more easier. And, uh, and I think uh, another uh, key thing uh, about what will it take uh, to take genetic testing into mainstream is that since it's been a, f a field that is very fragmented, and uh, if we look at, the, look at what we're analyzing here, there's 22,000 genes approximately, the human DNA. Uh, about them, maybe 5,300 um, carry some sort of medical relevance, which means that they are mentioned in literature. There exist some, some conclusions on the, on the variants. But at least according to our view, only about 1,500 at the moment are so-called clinically uh, relevant, medically relevant, and actionable. And uh, this is still a different way to look at the whole space. Um, earlier on, I think there's, we, we once listed that in the world there are about 40,000 uh, clinical genetic tests. And it's a very fragmented field. So what we are doing at the moment, we're centralizing uh, all of the testing, consolidating those large amounts of tests only to about a 250 panels that we're bringing onto the market. And we see that this is a key thing to do in order to just improve the use of genetic testing in the clinic. And uh, this also relates to costs. So uh, specialized providers uh, for certain indication, for example, or certain test type will have, find it hard to drive down the testing cost low enough. So centralization of the genetic testing is a central trend that needs to happen in order to, for that to feed into the personalized medicine. And uh, I think um, the two, two points made previously, in a way, I think you know, the technology is here. The sequencing cost is low. Um, I think we're, we're on the right track with the product concept. Uh, the product is here. The test, test cost, which is about 1,500 or 1,000 euros or US dollars approximately, I think that is here. But uh, as usual, uh, it's not only about the product or the technology. If we think about what will it take to take clinical uh, genetic testing into mainstream, um, there's a lot of things related to uh, cross-border challenges, for example, in the industry that are a problem at the moment or sort of hindering the development. And in Europe, for example, uh, DNA samples are uh, sensitive. DNA data is very sensitive. It's very understandable that there are restrictions on how to move samples around, how to move the information around. But uh, still, it is, it is being a problem at the moment, or it's a problem at the moment, because there are better tests uh, outside the borders of certain countries, and the cross-border regulations are hindering that. But this is, this is also an obstacle that can be overcome with further local presence. And for example, German, German clinical uh, testing companies are sending their samples anonymously to US uh, for analysis because of the uh, German regulation. But um, I think a bigger, 
bigger issue, we think of the development of the field and what will it take to really go into mainstream, um, is the reimbursement. Uh, so basically the payment for the tests. In UK, Germany, US, for example, uh, typical reimburse markets where insurance companies pay, pay for the medical bills, uh, not, the, not the government, or not, and no, there's no clinical budget for it either. So in, in the US, uh, the reimbursement needs to develop a lot. Uh, in Europe, the same thing. Uh, there's, if you ask, if you go into a, a biotech conference, uh, the, the consensus on NGS and genetic testing is very forward-looking. Then if you go to the customers, they're a little more conservative. They still f feel that the new tests are a little experimental, but they like the results, they like the convenience. But if you ask the regulatory people or, or the uh, insurance authorities, it, the new tests are very experimental. So they really need to still change their mindset and further see more proof from companies like us uh, that the approach works extremely well in the clinic. And uh, I think the only, only way forward uh, for coming over these sort of obstacles or things that slow us down when, when genetic testing is, is coming more popular in the clinic. Um, I think it's all about validation. So that companies like us, uh, we at least are preparing to you know, provide more and more validation data out in the open all the time. It's costly and it's time consuming. We have to run a lot of studies. For certain rare disorders, it's actually very hard to come up with a decent uh, clinical study because there's just not, not that much uh, patients around who, who to include in the study. But I still see that this is the, the key, that uh, also the clinical regulation, both in the US and uh, Europe, is moving towards the, re the direction where consumer genetics is perhaps a little harder to implement, and uh, where clinical genetics, uh, you have to provide more uh, clinical validation studies in order to run the tests. 23andMe is a good example of how it works in the US. So they, have, they are now being allowed to uh, give out clinical indications as a part of their test if they have for that certain indication out of hundreds, if they have a separate uh, clinical study for the indication. So it's the development of the, where it's going from a re regulatory point of view. And I think you know, companies like us, uh, we, ju we just really need to proactively comply with that and run the studies, do the conclusions, publish a lot, work with the scientific community. And um, sort of wrapping up, um, we think, um, Clinical genetic testing at the moment, we're, not, we're, we're still far away from um, the state where people's genomes are sequenced and uh, when they go to see a physician. But we are actually now in the phase where it starts to be very normal to run very low cost genetic tests. And uh, that's the state of the industry. What sort of needs to be done, um, at least from our point of view, the test price needs to go lower. Um, 1,000 US dollars uh, is a is a good sort of uh, barrier for the entire test, not the sequencing, which is usually referred in the whole genome sequencing, but the whole test cost needs to go below a thousand US dollars. And uh, this needs to be centralized. We don't see any other way uh, for the cost to go down or with volumes in, in, outside just centralizing the testing. And uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done on the cross-border cross -border testing regulation or restrictions, but also with reimbursement and the, what the thing that we're doing for it is just running a lot of clinical studies. But I think that's it. So that brief, uh, sums up um, my thoughts on how to, how to sort of um, help personalized medicine become mainstream, and that is just to change the genetic testing behind it. And we always say that as people talk about the uh, $1,000 genome, it's more about the $100 US dollar test cost. Thank you.